regarding parenting, especially among uh, for younger kids. So, um, you know, we're talking about things like screens and praise and verbalization and sleep training, uh, divorce, uh, daycare versus home care. I mean, all the stuff that all of you as parents probably see on the internet all the time in terms of books and blogs and articles, and you're probably given, you know, a hundred different answers for you know what you're supposed to do with with your kid about this and and one of the fundamental premises and themes of this book is uh, that um, parenting is not a one size fits all um, um, thing. It's you have to you you have to know the personality of your kid and and probably the personality of yourself. And that the science is telling us that the quote correct answer for many of these long-standing parental dilemmas um, isn't correct for everyone, and that you you may need to adjust, uh, you know, what the best course is for your particular child, based on uh, that child's temperament or a number of other factors. And so that's really. Um, so these are the these are the different chapters that, that we get into. So we talk about parenting styles like helicopter parenting and praise and gender development, screens, picky eating. And for each of the chapter is sort of organized in the same way um, where uh, I try to, to provide sort of this overall look uh, and an overall sort of summary of what the science actually says about that topic. And then if the answer is it depends and uh, kind of a spoiler alert, the answer often is, it depends. Then I try to go into that with a little more detail and say, well, actually, if your kid is a little bit more anxious, maybe you have to move things in this direction. If your kid is a little more aggressive, maybe you have to move things in this direction. If your kid is really mellow, you may need to tweak it in a different direction. Um, and then, you know, try to provide that kind of more specific guidance um, after. And, and then in the beginning of the book, there's a, also a chapter that helps you um, identify what your child's temperament is and your own, which you then can apply to all the subsequent chapters on, um, you know, that are, that are listed here. So that's the book. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about it. Uh, it came out a few weeks ago. So far, I think it's been doing really well, and I'm so excited to see that. And um, it's published by Oxford University Press. And um, most, you know, smaller publishing groups these days don't have huge marketing budgets anymore. So that's why it's, it's kind of um, up to me uh, to do a lot of this myself, but I, I'd encourage you to take a look and hopefully uh, maybe there'll be an opportunity here in some other venues to talk about some of these specific, uh, uh, specific topics if you have an interest. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about the book. Now let's kind of move to cannabis. And I wanna preface the discussion here um, by um, trying to appeal for a little bit of uh, moderation in these discussions. I think you know, it's, it's very easy to get sucked into this uh, uh, very sort of polar view that um, you know, cannabis is, uh, you know, is the worst thing. It's gonna result in the downfall of our society, that there, there's gonna be these kind of apocalyptic predictions about what happens if, uh, if there's legalization or if more people use. Um, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really wanna go, that, that's you know, not the way that I see things. I don't think that that's the way that the research says. On the other hand, um, you know, I think we have to be very open-minded and and ha and clear-headed about the risks. I mean, I think we have to be aware that there is a multi-billion-dollar industry that is trying to promote use in as many people as they possibly can, and that there has been some real downplaying and whitewashing uh, of the potential risks of cannabis. Um, I didn't make this statement up, but I completely agree with it that that. Cannabis is not heroin, it's not fentanyl, it is not the most dangerous substance out there. But I would agree with the statement that um, in my view, cannabis, the perception of cannabis has the biggest gap between the actual dangers of the drug 
and the perceived dangers of the drug. And there is certainly a campaign out there to lead you to believe that it's a cure-all for everything, that there really are no health risks. And there's almost this sort of religious fervor to it, that if you say anything negative about cannabis, you know, you, people start getting really upset with you and they tell you you're a prohibitionist or reefer madness, or, you know, you get all of these kind of statements. That, um, but I think I want to impress upon you that, you know, the, the risks are real. They're very well documented. A lot of the research that we're going to talk about is relatively new. Uh, so people may not have kept up with all of it. Um, but maybe there is sort of this medium between, you know, seeing cannabis in this, these apocalyptic terms. I'm, I'm actually a, a pretty strong believer in personal freedom and allowing adults to do, make decisions for themselves as long as they don't hurt other people. But I also am frankly very troubled and um, very irritated by what looks to me like a concerted effort to whitewash and downplay um, the very real risks that are associated with this drug. So a couple things before we get into the risk that I think are really relevant here. One is um, people really need to be aware that the, the cannabis that uh, you know maybe your parents use or that was associated with the 60s and the hippie generation is quite different than what people are using right now. And you know in the 60s, you know the average joint maybe was two percent, three percent THC. Uh, and the concentration and the potency of cannabis products today have, has just skyrocketed. And this graph doesn't even, it has continued to skyrocket. And, and now, you know, we have, uh, you know, smoke products that are easily 20 to, you know, getting to 30% or more. And there's this whole new area of much more concentrated products where the THC concentration can be, you know, 50, 70, sometimes close to 100%. And there is emerging evidence that this is actually very, this is very different physiologically. And we really should not be equating the, the you know, the marijuana of old uh, to the products that are, that are out there. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we know about the usage um, for, especially for adolescents. Um, so, this is uh, some data from the National Institute of Drug Abuse that it comes from uh, an, a, a well-known study called the Monitoring of Future, Monitoring the Future Study. What you can see is the percentage of eighth, 10th and 12th grades nationally that have either uh, used uh, cannabis in the last year or have some daily use. Um, what you can see over time is um, up until maybe a few years ago, um, the, the rate has been pretty steady. And, and, and on top of that, I think to put this in a broader context, the current generation of, of adolescents and young adults, um, the kind of the Gen Zs as, as they call it, this is actually one of the least substance using generations we've ever had. Um, the rates of things like cigarette smoking and alcohol use and other drug use have been dropping um, since around the mid 1990s. And, and for some of these substances are at the lowest point that we've ever measured them. The, the really, and really the only exception to that, the only, the only thing that has not really kind of come down precipitously has, has been cannabis. And in the past few years, uh, what we're starting to notice after it looked like things were pretty steady um, we're starting to see um, some indications that the things are now actually uh, rising. So not only is cannabis sort of not dropping like the other substances, it now looks like it is in some, in some cases it's on the rise, but you can see in other age groups, uh, it looks to be a little bit more flat. Um, and, and that's the picture sort of nationally. Looking at it in terms of Vermont, um, this is um, from the Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey this is looking at past 30 day use percentages among high schoolers. And so this is what I'm talking about. So we kind of, in, we kind of were coming down and then in 2004, there was a legalization for medical purposes. Things kind of plateaued. We then had decriminalization. Things still were kind of low, 
And then um, legalization happened in Vermont in 2018. And then in 2019, we had the very first statistically significant increase in adolescent use uh, in Vermont for uh, decades. So unfortunately, the, uh, the current youth risk behavior survey was canceled because of COVID. So we actually, I'm not gonna get data for, for 2020, but hopefully that will resume um, shortly after that. And then to put this on a national stage, um, th these data are a little old, uh, but this sort of shows you the prevalence of cannabis use by state and um, color coded for whether or not um, the state allows, uh, has legalized uses for, for uh, um, sort of medical marijuana and then recreational. It's a little old. So what you can certainly see is that there's quite a range um, from state to state. Vermont is right up here, kind of battling it out with states like Colorado and Washington. And you will certainly notice um, that there is an association between states that have more um, kind of liberal um, laws with regard to medicinal use and recreational use and the percentage of youth who use in that state. It's an association, so it's not causation. Um, in fact, you can sort of think that this kind of looks like Vermont in a way, but a lot of these states you know, would now turn green. Oregon has now has legal use uh, for recreational Massachusetts, Alaska, all of, the, all of the states that have legalized more recently are also up here. And then looking at it another way, you can sort of see that the highest percentages are concentrated here in New England, um, and then all on the West Coast, and then of course, Colorado, which um, often is uh, sort of the national leader when it comes to uh, cannabis usage across lots of age groups. And one of the things that we know that really drives uh, the, the, the amount of usage among teens is their perceived risk. So you can actually see if you sort of track both the uh, how much um, adolescents are using and also track if they perceive that there's um, you know, significant risks of harm uh, for using cannabis, you can see almost this lockstep uh, progression. So it really matters quite a bit um, what adolescents are hearing and what they're believing uh, when it comes to the risks associated with cannabis uh, as a, you know, a strong predictor of their, their likelihood to, to try it and, and use it more regularly. And then one, of the, uh, one more thing before we get into the specific risk that I think many of us in public health are really concerned about is that there is sort of this myth that you know, you know, that the recreational and legal market is really kind of mom and pops, ex-hippies, kind of, they've got a few plants and, you know, it's, it's very sort of low key, but, you know, the reality is, is that this is a huge business and people are recognizing this and uh, more and more, you know, major companies, including most recently Philip Morris, uh, you know, the famous uh, tobacco company are jumping into the game. And that's troubling for a lot of us because, you know, we have felt like we have fought so hard for so many years and it has taken so much money to get finally the, uh, the people to be aware of the risks of, of tobacco use and to lower the amount of use in adolescents. And now for many of us, it feels like, you know, we're just, we're like Sisyphus. We're going to have to, we're rolling the stone back up again and we're going to have to do the same thing uh, all over again. And, I think we're troubled by that because we know from many of the lawsuits uh, that, that were filed against the big tobacco manufacturers that we realized that when it came to adolescent use, it wasn't some byproduct, you know, some unfortunate byproduct of their marketing um, that resulted in kids getting hooked on cigarettes. It was their marketing strategy. I mean, that was their plan all along. And so, you know, why would we think that things are going to be that dramatically different now that the same companies are getting involved in the, in the game when, when it comes to cannabis? So we just need to be sort of aware of the sort of the corporate uh, um, presence uh, behind this that I think people are trying to hide as best they can. So let's get into a little bit about the health effects. Um, these are the areas that we're going to cover and we're going to 
we're going to cover this fairly quickly. And, and um, if you have questions at the end, I'd be happy to try to. I know some of these may be a little bit technical, but I do want to be able to sort of cover all of these. So uh, one thing to mention is that you know when it comes to cannabis, we're not talking about a single compound. It's not a sort of a single substance that in you know the, in the entire plant, you know there are you know maybe a hundred different compounds, many of which can have effects on the brain. So you know the one that we talk about the most is tetrahydrocannabinol THC. That's the that is the specific compound that gives people the high and may be responsible for many of the negative effects of 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 uh, cannabis. But there are many other compounds as well. Probably the second most famous one is cannabidiol, uh, which in some ways may have different and sometimes even opposing properties as THC. And then if you're following this, you know that there's, you know, people are identifying other compounds that also may have physiological effects. So there are all of these different compounds in a cannabis plant. They can be present in varying concentrations. And it's, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why, especially when it comes to, you know, quote, uh, medical marijuana, that physicians get a little uncomfortable about, you know, prescribing or recommending it because there's just so many different compounds. I mean, I wouldn't say here, I'm recommending some random combination of a hundred different compounds for my patients. It just seems a bit irresponsible. And so I think that's one of the things that gives us uh, some cause. Um, the brain does have, obviously for, you know, for uh, cannabis to have an effect on the brain, there have to be receptors for it in the brain. And, and the brain does have um, what's called an endocannabinoid uh, system. So there are, um, you know, brain chemicals that have chemical properties that look similar to cannabis, and that's why cannabis can bind to those same receptors. And we know that that system uh, is very complicated, but it looks like it's an involved in a lot of very important neurological functions like brain growth and some of the supportive uh, supportive systems that support neurons, the brain cells and uh, their activity and their relationship with other neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And what uh, the plant, what the cannabis uh, plant seems to do and THC is it binds to those receptors, but it binds them actually in a way that's stronger than some of the natural brain chemicals. And so rather than sort of you know, binding and then letting go, it sort of binds and then hangs on, and that sometimes causes a, a stronger physiological reaction. There have been a number of studies that have actually looked at, you know, what cannabis does to the brain. Um, and, you know, to summarize the huge literature in, you know, a few seconds, I, you know, I, I think there are lots and lots of studies that show changes. Um, they show changes anatomically. They show changes in terms of how, you know, uh, uh, functionally, you know, activity level. Um, they show changes in sort of the structural integrity of some of the supporting cells in the brain. Uh, but to be honest, sometimes they, it can be hard to sometimes know exactly what these changes mean, uh, whether they're good or bad. Um, this is a, a challenge that um, I think plagues a lot of neuroimaging research, which is, you know, really incredible. You get these amazing pictures, um, but then the interpretation of, well, this part of the brain is a little bit bigger or smaller or grows faster or grows, you know, that I think um, there's still a lot of work left to be done to really interpret what these changes really mean, uh, but the changes are definitely there. All right, let me spend a little bit of time on, on cannabis and psychosis, because uh, for many of us, uh, I think this is the area that we have um, the, some of the most concern, uh, um, both in terms of the research, and I can tell you, you know, when I'm on call and, um, you know, working in our emergency department and admitting people to our inpatient psychiatry service, um, it's something that I see, you know, far too often. Um, but it's also very complicated and it can be a place where um, it can be very uh, confusing and I think uh, people can sort of use the, what, the research to their own political purposes 
um, on both sides. So let me try to explain, I think, what, what we know about this. So it's, it's very clear that there is a strong association between cannabis use, particularly um, heavier use and earlier use and the development of psychotic symptoms um, up to full-blown schizophrenia, which as many of you know, is a, you know, a long-standing um, psychotic illness where people have declines in functioning and, and can have hallucinations and, and paranoia and, and things like that. So we know that this association is there. Um, the, this uh, you know, heavy cannabis use is probably associated with at least a doubling um, and maybe, and, and in some studies, a quadrupling of the risk of developing a psychotic disorder. But it's an association, right? Most of these studies show association. So that doesn't necessarily prove that cannabis use is causing the psychosis. And so, you know, what often happens politically on the internet is there's a study and then somebody says, yeah, but that doesn't prove that they're associated. And so we get sort of stuck in, in this debate because there are other, there are a lot of mechanisms that could be happening. So it could be that actually people who are prone to develop psychosis are more likely to use cannabis use, right? It could be that cannabis use causes the psychosis. And it could be that there's some other factor that's related both to increased psychosis and increased cannabis use. And um, right now, in terms of, you know, people are, are getting better and better to sort of tease out the effects. Um, there are ways to do this both statistically and how you design a research study. And, you know, some of the best interpretations of all of this data are suggesting that you don't have to decide between one pathway or another. And that what is likely happening is all of these pathways are contributing to this association. Um, there was an important paper came out um, by you know, one of the smartest people I know uh, in, in terms of disentangling all of these things. And, and that, was, um, that was their conclusion that you, you, you don't have to sort of say, no, this is all attributed to some other factor or it's all causal, all of these things. Are, are playing a role. So it may be true that, um, that, that all of this link is not because cannabis use is directly causing psychosis, but it's probably true that some of it is uh, and that that causal link uh, remains. And, and th this is, you know, I think um, where our, our field uh, is, uh, is starting to sort of coalesce. Uh, and this is also reflected, this is a study looking at um, admissions to an emergency department in, in Colorado. You know, you can see this steady increase in um, visits that are related to cannabis. And you can see that a big uh, percentage of these actually are, you know, behaviorally related. And when, by behaviorally related, very often, that's exactly what we're talking about are people who are coming in, um, in a, you know, acutely psychotic um, in the context of, you know, new usage or heavy usage. And that's certainly, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that we're seeing in our emergency rooms as well. Another very hotly debated topic is about, um, can cannabis be contributing to violence? We sort of, the, the, the stereotype of cannabis is that it kind of mellows you out and you're happy and you just kind of lay around and giggle. Um, and certainly that, you know, certainly that occurs. Um, but uh, there's also increasing uh, research that uh, seems to suggest that, um, especially over long term with higher potency cannabis, uh, with earlier use, uh, that uh, there is a link between, uh, you know, violent behavior and the use of cannabis. Um, this is a, um, what this study is, is something called a meta-analysis. So this is when a, when a group of investigators try to summarize they try to take all the research studies that are out there on a, on a certain topic and then combine them to sort of get to an overall conclusion about a certain thing. So this was, so these investigators took all of these different studies that looked at this association and then put them all together and then came with a final sort of conclusion. So 
a, a, an odds ratio, this is an odds ratio. So if something hits the number one, that means there's no increased or decreased risk, it's the same. And what this is showing that is, you know, this is moving towards increased risk. But if you look at the different studies, uh, actually, I think this really shows, you know, how studies can be used politically and how you can cherry pick studies because, you know, if, you, if you're trying to minimize um, what people think about the risk between violence and cannabis, you'll say, hey, look at this study. This study actually found a decreased risk or this, this study actually showed, you know, enough, but, you know, you can pick. And if you put all of these studies together, you can see that the majority of them end up uh, supporting that there, there is this association. Now, what about cognitive functioning? So again, um, pretty good evidence um, that, um, especially for people who are, are using frequently, that there are deficits in attention, in memory, uh, in learning. I think the, the, the bigger question is, do those cognitive deficits persist even when someone is not acutely intoxicated? And are, is it possible that some of these cognitive deficits are irreversible even when someone decides that they're going to stop using? Um, so very little debate about the cognitive effects when someone's intoxicated. Uh, there are several meta-analyses that seem to suggest that these, some of these deficits can persist even when someone is not acutely intoxicated. Um, but the good news is that it looks like um, most of them, at least, when somebody decides to stop using, uh, that these are relatively uh, reversible, um, which I think is good. There are some studies suggesting about how this may actually be happening. This was a study from the, the very prestigious journal Nature that looks at the mechanism through which this may be happening. I won't go into that. It gets a little bit technical. I do want to mention, you know, there is... Uh, there have been some studies that look specifically at IQ in cannabis. And again, people will emphasize different studies depending on sort of where, you know, what, what they want to, where they want to lead people. Um, maybe one of the most famous studies uh, came out, again, in a very prominent journal about 10 years ago. It found quite a dramatic drop, an IQ drop of eight points um, among uh, people who were very heavy users. So to, to, to get that drop, you basically had to have a have a be cannabis dependent. I think at multiple points of time across a long period of time. Um, so this, you know, for people who are are trying to you know sound the alarm about uh, cannabis, this is a study that's often cited. It's not a perfect study, um, and for people who are um, for people who are trying to downplay the cognitive risk, they will cite another study a twin study that actually showed that, um, that these differences in IQ didn't look like were causally related. But of course, that study had an incredibly light definition of what cannabis use was. And so um, they counted heavy use as anyone who used more than 30 times in their entire life. So just to point out that these you know, technical methodological differences that a study can have can make the difference in what a study finds. And then of course, then you layer that on what studies, you know, people who are trying to use these to more political purposes decide to cite and not cite. Um, you know, you can see how this gets layered on top of that. Um, this was a study that um, shows, you know, looks at the mechanism. There's a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens, which may be very important in terms of uh, motivated behavior, reward, what we call reward, uh, sort of reward dependent behavior. And this was showing how uh, the activation of that area uh, seems to get, they say blunted, no, no pun intended, with the, with the use of uh, chronic use of cannabis. Anxiety is another reason why a lot of people will, will say that they use, uh, they, they use cannabis, it helps them feel more relaxed. And um, certainly, at least in the short term, um, you know, that may be true. But interestingly, again, when people look at the long term and the development of anxiety disorders, what you often see is the opposite, and that there is actually a positive association between cannabis use and anxiety disorders. So people feeling more anxious uh, in the long term. And that's not that different than, you know, say for 
uh, medications like benzodiazepine, Valium, and Xanax and medicines that I really almost never use uh, in adolescence because of the same phenomenon that people feel really good in the moment and then the medicine wears off and then they sometimes feel more anxious than they did even before using the drug. And so that motivates them to use even more. And then you get sort of locked into this cycle where your two choices are to sort of be using this drug uh, all the time or um, to try to stop. And this is also an area where I think the high potency products may be playing a role. Um, I've seen much more uh, anxiety generation from people who have used the high potency just recently helped uh, an adolescent um, stop using cannabis. And she noticed completely on her own that the cannabis was making her anxiety much, much worse and was actually motivated to stop. Another troubling area is uh, suicide. Um, and uh, there have been some recent studies. If you look, these are all new studies, right? So these are 2019 and 2020 kind of studies. Another meta-analysis of a huge sample, uh, which found that overall cannabis was associated with a tripling of a, of a, uh, a suicide attempt in adulthood and uh, the risks of, of depression. And the study, quote, you know, that they estimated that over 400,000 cases of adult depression in our country may be attributable to cannabis use. This was another study that just came out this year. Uh, again, 200 youth with mood disorders. So everyone in this study had uh, some kind of mood disorder. So that helps eliminate the reverse causation idea that it's actually the you know, people with mood disorders who are using the cannabis more. They found that um, those with a cannabis use disorder, we even had an increased risk, even above having depression for having a death for any reason, uh, for non for self-harm, non-fatal self-harm injury, uh, and uh, being a uh, victim of homicide. Another area that you often hear about is what's called the gateway hypothesis. So the gateway hypothesis suggests that um, cannabis, and it's not specific to cannabis, that, that the, the use of quote, softer drugs, so that would include cannabis, but alcohol and maybe even tobacco, that that actually some, in some ways primes the brain and makes people at higher risk to use other drugs like opiates or cocaine or methamphetamines later in life. And I know some of the advocates like to say that, that the gateway hypothesis has been debunked and it really has been anything but debunked. They may wish it were debunked, but it really hasn't been. And there continue to be studies, pretty rigorous studies where they're controlling for genetics. Um, they're talking about, they're using animal models, you know, to suggest that, um, that this remains a risk and is something that we have to be, uh, nervous about, although, as I said, it's not specific just to cannabis. It could be true for um, alcohol as well. This was a study that looked at uh, this phenomenon in rats and found that not only uh, was uh, sort of priming a rat by using THC, making that rat more likely to use um, heroin later in its life, it actually increased the risk that its offspring uh, would use more heroin uh, in terms of this sort of multi-generational or what they call a cross-generational gateway, uh, which to me is really troubling. It, how that could work gets pretty technical. It, it may involve something called epigenetics, um, uh, but um, you know, I just wanted to point out that, that I thought this was a very important study to make sure people knew. Driving also is, a, is another risk. Um, you know, there are some troubling trends in states like Colorado where they're seeing, uh, you know, more fatalities that are involving uh, cannabis and that the percentage of fatalities is going, is moving faster than even the, you know, you would expect it to go up a little bit because more people are just using cannabis, right? But that rate seems to be beyond just the increased number of people. And, and again, some evidence that there can be some impairments, maybe through the changes in the visual system um, for people even when they're not uh, acutely intoxicated. 
So I know I covered a lot of ground and happy to talk more about this, um, but I did want, but I think that the overall summary here is that there is a lot of research and a lot of it is quite new uh, that suggests that, that, you know, the bottom line is that cannabis is just not a great thing for a developing brain and that the harm span sort of a whole number of cognitive and mental health domains, including suicide, memory, uh, driving, motivation, anxiety. And unfortunately, the risks are really not reaching the public that well. What we're hearing sometimes is actually the opposite. Oh, you drive better if you're high, or you actually, this is a treatment for a schizophrenia. Um, and, and really, you know, I think that, that the evidence, not that you can't find a study that, that says the opposite, right? Just like you can find studies that, that argue against global warming. Um, but if you look at sort of the majority of the studies, it, it, you know, I think it paints a pretty clear picture. So for um, the next part, and then we can open things up to questions. I just thought I would sort of mention a little bit about talking to kids about, about cannabis use and, um, and then and your replies to some of the things that you may be likely to hear when you get into these discussions. So um, one of my points I would say is um, talk about it early. It's easier to talk about with little kids. They're much more likely to be involved in this as kids. When you bring it up later, it's not so weird and awkward. Um, so if you have the opportunity to bring it up and by, you know, young, I'm talking about, you know, middle school, um, you know, that, that kind of, and sometimes it's good to not start with, you know, pointing your finger, are you using drugs, you know, are you using marijuana, but, you know, maybe talk about the climate of your school, is there pressure or other kids, what are you hearing, what are you thinking, you know, it's, a, it's an easier way to bring up a little less personal. Um, some other points I would bring up is, you know, be aware of your own behavior. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of, you know, some of my patients and their parents are using a lot of cannabis and they're like, well, wait a minute, why should I, you know, they're doing it, what, you know, why shouldn't I, right? Um, it's good to be clear about where you stand, what your expectations are. Um, sometimes it's good to provide teens with uh, reliable sources of information, but don't make them read it in front of you. You know, sometimes they need to go off on their own and think about it and talk it over with their friends. That's okay. That's a great way to, uh, to do that. You don't, you know, you might just want to let them sort of digest some of this um, at their own pace. And then some lessons learned um, from tobacco, uh, which is that if you just hit adolescents with health risk, you know, don't, don't smoke or you're going to get lung cancer in 50 years. That, you know, that's not, even though that may be true, um, that doesn't motivate behavior uh, that well. And many kids are actually motivated by other things other than just the health risks. So for some kids, it's not, you know, the, the worry that they may develop uh, a psychotic illness, but if you bring up, for instance, the environmental impact. So, you know, growing cannabis um, requires enormous amounts of water and enormous amounts of electricity. And so some people might be more motivated about the environmental impact of, of, you know, a big market. Some people uh, are motivated by the fact that they don't feel they want to get ripped off by a big corporation who is profiting off their, their usage. And so that mode, or they, they're worried about sort of preying upon marginalized groups. Um, you know, for some kids, that's, you know, that's the way that's going to have to be more compelling. And then also when you have, if you have an adolescent, you may want to just talk about especially if you're worried that there may be some risk uh, of them using, you may want to consider what, what ahead of time, what are you going to do if, you know, the, your child is in a situation where they, they, are, they are using, they may be high, you may want to consider a no punishment policy or come, just call me, there, there won't be consequences, I'll come pick you up, you know, if you're really worried that there could be um, significant harm, especially with your child sort of concealing their use. And then let me just talk about, you know, some of the things that, that your adolescent may be saying, you may be hearing, and maybe some of the responses, and then we can um, kind of open it up. So, um, so here's one that I hear all the time, you know, it's fine, right? It's natural. It's a plant. What's the big deal? So it's good to, to remind ourselves that tobacco is just a plant and that there are tons of products out there in the natural world that are deadly and toxic. And just because something is natural or grows out of the ground, that doesn't mean that it's absolutely safe. 
Um, people, kids may have the idea that everybody is trying it. And you, you can point out that even in a state like Vermont, which has some of the highest cannabis use in the entire country, that the vast majority of high school students are not using cannabis. Uh, and many of them don't, uh, are not. And, and right now, I would, you know, really, as I mentioned before, the current generation of adolescents are, are not as into substances as, as other previous ones have. And, and I think that we can uh, take advantage of that in a positive way. Another thing that I realized all the time was that um, a lot of people were dismissing anything I or any physician would say uh, because we were being accused of being sort of drug company pawns and just doing things to promote the manufacture of opiates, which you know, at least I thought it was kind of ridiculous, but I realized I've, I was running into this a lot and I needed to address it. And I, I take no money from any pharmaceutical company. And I find it actually quite ironic because many of the people making these accusations are actually those who have, you know, financial conflicts of interest with the cannabis industry. And, and many people, and this is sometimes the elephant in the room that can be awkward to bring up, but people's own personal use of cannabis may be influencing and causing some bias about their medical opinions about it as well. In terms of it makes me feel better, you know, if you hear that, I think we have to understand that, you know, especially short term, people do feel better, but that there can be a difference between uh, short and long term help, and that we, you know, we need to look for other alternatives if someone's feeling sort of anxious or awkward or depressed that are not as likely to make things worse in the long term. Cannabis is medicine, right? So here I'd say, yeah, there are, you know, we have to acknowledge that there, there may be some medicinal qualities of some of these, at least some of the compounds uh, in the cannabis plant, but you gotta be careful of this bait and switch that I see all the time. So what will often happen is that someone will find some study related to some medicinal use of some, some part of cannabis. Um, and the study often is a very small amount or it's just CBD or it's taken in very sort of controlled amounts. And then that study is then manipulated, say, see, cannabis is good for you. And then they use that to justify, you know, some, you know, 50% THC product that's called, you know, Gorilla Glue number four or, you know, alien mind explosion. And, and you know, there's, you, you just have to be aware that actually there's no, really no evidence that taking these, you know, highly concentrated products have, any kind of relevance to the study that often gets quoted to be to support it. And you just have to be aware of that strong bait and switch that's out there. Another myth is that the only way that cannabis can cause harm is, is if it's laced with something else. And um, while lacing does occur and can make some of these products really dangerous, um, it is certainly true that cannabis all by itself can cause harms. And I can tell you many, many times you know, when we admit people to our emergency room and our inpatient unit, that's the only thing that comes up on the talk screens. And, um, you know, and I think that that's a point that we have to make sure people know. Another thing that you'll often hear as, uh, you know, some advocates become sort of statistical experts is that, you know, correlation does not mean causation. So they, this is a way to sort of throw out and dismiss all of these studies that associate cannabis with harms. This is true. I mean, and this is a problem. Uh, correlation does not mean causation, but it is also true that among the research on the harms are quite a few studies that are randomized studies that are animal research and experimental and that have some cognitive, that have some uh, um, sophisticated designs that actually help us tease out uh, different ways that two variables may be related to each other. So it is, it is not a very strong argument to basically throw out an entire literature um, of, of, uh, of this length. Sometimes you hear that nobody ever died from cannabis. This is untrue. Um, even if you're talking, I mean, certainly you don't have near the amount of deaths that you might with uh, you know, opiates, uh, but there have been uh, reports of, uh, of of sudden death that are attributed directly to cannabis use. And then you have to also think about all the indirect effects that can come from uh, car, fa you know, car fatalities and suicide and a number of other mechanisms. 
And that's it. Um, here are a few places that you can go if you're looking for uh, more resources, scripts, and talking points in terms of talking with kids about this. And uh, I know I went through a lot in 45 minutes, so I appreciate your, your patience and I'm happy to stop sharing my screen and talk about Dr. it. Dr. thank you so much. I'll applaud because our attendees can applaud. Um, we do have a few questions if we want to dive into the Q&A portion now. Okay, our sure. first question was, regarding to the idea of um, adolescents need safe opportunities to experience low risk and the fact that we're feeling as though or some of the attendees are feeling as though cannabis is providing too high of a risk that's too easily accessible amongst adolescents and they're wondering how you might suggest finding out what and how much a child may be using if you suspect that they are using. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is where it's, it's great to have an open dialogue and, and to start early. Um, and, you know, probably I, it's not going to seem surprising when you know, the author of Parenting Made Complicated is going to say that there probably isn't a set answer for all of this. I mean, I think I would have a different strategy for a kid that um, I think is pretty at low risk for really getting into trouble with this and the one that I suspect may be using uh, quite, a, quite a bit and, and maybe concealing some of that. Um, you know, for the for the one who is probably at lower risk, I think it's um, I think it's important to convey you know what your expectations are and you know what you know what would happen if they if somebody disclosed that they've been using some, um, and I and I don't you know I don't necessarily think that you know putting out big punishments is really the answer. Uh, on the other hand, I think, you know, you have to be, be aware if you have a kid who is driving and using cannabis, um, you know, that, that there are not only health risks, but there are real legal risks of that. And, you know, allowing a kid the keys, I think, in, is uh, hazardous on, on multiple different levels. Thank you, Dr. Ritu. Another question is if you could speak to the potency of edibles and THC slash vaping devices and some of the concerns that might be related within that focus. Yeah, so um, a lot of, there, there has been some research that shows that a very disproportionate um, amount of, of people who wind up in the emergency department um, is because of edibles. And it's not necessarily because the products are super potent, um, but that the effects take longer. And so what ends up happening is somebody ends up, you know, basically using way more than they would have otherwise. So because there's this delayed effect, you know, someone may eat two brownies or something like that, and they won't really notice it. And then, you know, down the road, you know, they're feeling, you know, really out of it. So that's, I think, one of the, one of the scary parts about edibles um, that's why some states, and I think Vermont is considering this, is really trying to market how much, you know, to really be very clear about the packaging, um, about how much uh, THC is in edible products. Uh, that I don't think that that's going to necessarily solve the problem. And then what was the other part about the, uh, the vaping? Yeah, so if you remember, right before the pandemic, you know, one of the big stories in the news were all of these kids that were having, and, and adults were having these acute respiratory problems due to vaping. And uh, again, a disproportionate number of that seemed to be related to vaping of cannabis. And I'm not sure they ever got to the bottom of it. I think there was some concern that it actually may not have been the THC itself, but some of the additives that are used to preserve things, some, the, some of the vitamin E compounds that might be involved there. Um, but I, you know, I think that that's, that continues to be a concern. I think maybe when, you know, once the pandemic wears down, we start hearing about other things again, we may hopefully learn more about that. Thank you, Dr. Batu. I actually attended a panel a few months into the pandemic that stated that the ch the children and adolescents that were vaping socially prior to the pandemic actually statistically are vaping less now mm -hmm. during you know stay at home orders and quarantine however individuals that were vaping more regularly or daily within middle school and high school students across the country are vaping more that makes at sense. Home due yeah. to stress right so that's some of the numbers that we're starting to see but again so many of us are talking about covid and covid 
hospital alone in the last few months. We have two more questions so far. One is, um, we have an individual that's curious to know your response, Dr. Atu, regarding alcohol and how that's a you know way worse substance, but it is in fact legal. Yeah. So what are some of your perspectives on that? Well, uh, from the political, my political side, I think that that, you know, is a valid argument. Um, and, you know, I think that that, you know, alcohol comes with, you know, huge risks. They're very different risks, though. Um, you know, different body systems, um, you know, you, you, we're not worried so much about psychosis. We're more worried about sort of aggressive behavior when someone's intoxicated. So I, I think it's okay to worry about both. I, I get frustrated with the, with the sort of the arguments that we have to either uh, be worried about one or the other. Um, I'm, I, I, don't, I really wouldn't want my adolescent to be using either right now. And, um, and you know, I think, I think we just, you know, just have to be aware that there, there are a lot of risks. And I think as, um, as more people use more cannabis, I think the numbers, the, the sort of societal costs and health costs are going to start catching up. And, and uh, we also have to be aware of that um, in some of these economic analyses, because yes, we may be bringing in some tax income, um, but, and that will show up on one line in a budget, but there are all these other dispersed costs that will not show up so easily um, that will actually sort of draw down and, and we may not be, you know, for people who are really motivated by the tax, the tax benefits, uh, the income benefits, I think, you know, as we're seeing in California, they're not even getting close to the projections that they had hoped for. I'm also going to drop a link for all of our attendees to the One Choice Initiative, which is the idea that um, substances are set at the legal limit of 21 and over for a reason, right? So, and how we in prevention actually talk about 25 for brain development's sake, um, but 25 can be a scary number for some of our kiddos to hear. It feels very far away. So, but that idea of, you know, all substances are illegal until you are 21, right? And that, that can be a good starting point for some parents. Our last question is from our very own coalition director, Mariah. And she was wondering, she has two, sorry, Mariah, I'm trying to find your question. She has two teenage boys. And as they're getting older, they're seeing a lot more media. So shows, memes and such, normalizing teens using marijuana and other drugs. Do you have any suggestions for how she could respond to her boys about this? Well, look at them. I mean, and, and you know, don't, don't just sort of dismiss them, but look at them and explain, I think, you know, what's deceiving about those and, um, Again, what might be more powerful rather than just sort of talking about the health risk is, is to sort of say, this is an attempt to manipulate you. And, and for, some, for some adolescents, that's gonna actually be more important than conveying any particular health risk. And so, you know, I, I would, I think adolescents should feel, should be upset that there are these big corporations that are trying to trick them into, um, you know, these behaviors that are going to be very hard to stop. And, and, and you know, I, I think that that is, can be a very important you know, avenue to pursue. That's a very good point, Dr. Vitu. We know millennials care very much about the health risks and we know Gen Zers care much more about the manipulation and the marketing tactics that they're mm -hmm. being targeted because on average, at least for the tobacco industry, if you get a user under 18, you get a user for life is usually what happens, so. We have no other questions thus far. So I just want to say thank you so, so much again for joining us today. And I'll give you a big round of applause. Thank you. So, you know, I, the attendees yeah, are applauding. And the ability to talk for a couple of minutes about the book too. And I hope, I hope that this information is helpful to people. Yes, and this is recorded and I will be sending out the, the recording to everyone who registered in case you want to review it again. I'll have Dr. Ratu's website and the new book available as well for folks to see. I'm getting a lot of thank yous in the chat and just, I hope that this was helpful. And um, I will be sending a short survey to all in attendance. Um, and that will also include other topics that you might wanna hear from involving what parent in can develop or what maybe Dr. Ratu can come back and speak on. So we will be in touch and thank you all. Terrific, thank you.